Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, The Value of Remote Patient Monitoring Before and During COVID-19 and the Powerful Impact on the Future of Telemedicine. Vivify Health is honored to sponsor and present this webinar with a tremendous panel of participants and a tremendous moderator that I'll introduce here in a moment. You know, reimbursement has really improved from Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services for chronic care management and RPM in the last few years. Telehealth waivers during COVID really accelerated the adoption of remote patient monitoring. And it's now, of course, reimbursed for both chronic and acute conditions. Hello, I am Bill Paschal, Vice President of Business Development here at Vivify Health, and I am pleased to introduce you to our featured panel of speakers. Today's distinguished speakers include Andrew Watson, who has recently published multiple articles in PubMed, is a past president of American Telemedicine Association, and leads the telehealth efforts at University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, and is a past president of the American Telemedicine Association, and a good friend. Christopher Northam began serving the medical community as the Army Medical Service Corps officer in the 82nd Airborne and also served in the Pentagon. Now at HCA as VP of Telehealth, he brings world-class clinical services via telehealth to patients across the country and has been very involved in COVID-19 screening and monitoring for HCA employees. Dr. Joe Cavadar is a pioneer and leader in connected health for almost 30 years. Now is president of the American Telemedicine Association and co-chair of the American Medical Association's Digital Medicine Payment Advisory Group and a publisher of multiple books on telemedicine and telehealth. We're very happy to have these three presenting today. And as moderator, I am very pleased to introduce Christy Henderson. I met Christy when she was leading telehealth at the University of Mississippi Medical Center, and she was the change agent for Mississippi to reimburse for remote patient monitoring. She moved from there to Ascension and set up Good Health in Austin for the national delivery of all their telehealth and remote care services. Always looking for new challenges and more innovation, she moved to lead clinical services at Amazon Care, modernizing care delivery for all of their employees and has now found a home at Optum Health as SVP of Telehealth and Innovation. Hey everybody, this is Christy Henderson, Senior Vice President of Telehealth and Innovation at Optum Health. We are so glad you're here today for our webinar. I'd like to introduce you to our first speaker, a friend and colleague, Dr. Andrew Watson, who is the Clinical IT Transformation Leader at UPMC International's Division. Thank you for being with us, Dr. Watson. Christy, thank you very much for the kind introduction. And also, I want to thank Vivify for sponsoring this and also my co-presenters who are all good friends and I respect them very much. And the task that I was given is to talk about remote monitoring prior to COVID-19. And it's an interesting history, but COVID really accelerated us. And Christopher and Joe will talk about that process. The evolution of remote monitoring is really quite remarkable in a large part has been driven by the consumer electronics market. As we know, so much of what we do in our lives today in our society has been driven by companies like Google, Microsoft, Apple, Verizon, AT&T, and the like, and they are wirelessly connecting, training, enabling, video linking, and analyzing our patients. And this is what's been behind remote monitoring. It really is the endpoints that the patients or the members or the consumers have driving information. And this was the nidus of remote monitoring. And it goes way back to around 2000 or before, but really we saw it emerge in full form around 2015. And I'll get to that in just a moment. Telemedicine came about in three different forms, in my opinion, where the traditional form of telemedicine, such as rural clinics, emergency care, telestroke, derm, path, radiology, all happened and started around 2000 and have been maturing since then. This concept of live video visits straight to the customer or the members or the patient's phones came in full force in 2015, and the newest form came in 2018. And this is really the form of remote patient monitoring, and it's very different from the others. It's asynchronous. It involves a lot of patient-generated 
health data. It typically has people screening the data and how you move the data and analyze it is very important. And all three forms of telemedicine work together, but I certainly feel that in the future, in many feel that remote monitoring has enormous potential to really dominate the field of telemedicine and provide longitudinal interactions for primary care, subspecialty care, post-acute care, and the like. And that's why it's so exciting is the potential of it. And remote monitoring has a lot of different features. You can ask survey questions for post-acute care or research. You can push educational videos that patients watch when they're ready to. This is what you do after discharge. This is how you take this infusion. This is what it's like to come see me in clinic. There's even a help button, please call me back. They can enter self-entered data, such as a weight or a blood pressure or a glucose level. You could even do video calls. But again, it's primarily designed to be asynchronous. And this picture is a metaphor, but it's like having a Doppler weather radar screening cohorts of your members, patients looking for trouble, hot spotting, getting inbound data, trying to understand what's going on. It's a giant early warning system or care management system. But the promise is that it's asynchronous, it's scalable, and really meant to be commoditized as well, and in large part driven by consumer electronics. And it's like an air traffic control tower. The monitoring systems don't really care what type of plane or how many members or where the plane is going. It's trying to coordinate all this and provide hypertension monitoring to primary care, post-acute COPD monitoring, looking at congestive heart failure management for a payer. So it's really multifaceted and meant to be a giant asynchronous care coordination team. Behind all of the remote monitoring was the evolution of the technology and being able to use multiple different forms of technology. The monitoring can have bring your own device, it can have tablets, it can have kits. So there's a range from your own phones or tablets or computers that a patient or a member might buy to a tablet they might have or one you could ship them, or you can design kits that come prepackaged in a box that might have a blood pressure, a pulse ox, and a scale. They open up the box, they turn it on, they have a miniature clinic at home. It communicates with a hospital or a clinic using cellular networks. Again, it's meant to be easy, asynchronous, at home, and mobile. But again, the goal here is to have a very easy way for patients or members to interact with their devices. And the bring your own device is very important because it should be very easy in these screenshots to receive a text or download an app to register in a secure fashion with a sending system or a health system to look at the end user license agreement and sign up. And the BYOD has come a long way across many platforms. You can answer yes, no questions, enter data. You can actually ask for a callback, watch video visits. Again, the whole capacity is seamless for the folks that are using it. But more than the technology is the clinical workflow. How do you drive monitoring? And this is where monitoring really has been growing up in the last decade. It's the business need. It's how you tie it together, how you design the clinical workflow so it interfaces with doctors, nurses, care management teams, primary care, subspecialty care. And you have to look at the clinical and business need and to try to triage who needs to be on the program. How do you enroll them? Because if you put everybody on the system, your call center could become overwhelmed with the amount of volume that comes in. And then you have a pathway. Is it a bring your own device or do you send them a kit? The kit is more controlled, it's more expensive, and it's more equipment you have to get back. The bring your own device also may be less expensive, more self-directed, but it might be difficult for them to set up but each one has its own pluses and minuses. In amongst all of this technology is a call center of experts who should be watching and can be watching the data and managing some of the logistics and technical problems. But developing pathways or clinical programs is important, so it's a very scripted, meaningful experience. And behind all this, your technology, your clinical design, who you monitor, when you monitor, how often, it's really this whole operational model that supports it. And as you'll see, that this design of a platform as a service is very important. How do you bring this all together? And the platform as a service model is a very effective one to use 
It has a centralized operational team. There's data flow, there's a vendor, and there's hardware. And there's much that goes into this. But the goal is when you take this to the front lines of your payer care management team or your clinical team is to make the interface with the complexity of this as simple as possible. It's like getting in your car and turning it on and driving. You don't want to know about the engine, the transmission, um, the type of electrical systems it has. You just want to turn it on and drive it. But there's a lot that goes into this platform, which really was evolving up until the COVID era. There are many pieces to these platforms, the durable medical equipment, the marketing, the legal implications, how you integrate it, where does the data flow, how do you generate dashboards, pathways, alerts, what videos do you use, what type of hardware do you send out. And this whole logistical milieu has been evolving over the last decade, and really we worked at UPMC with this extensively, trying to get this platform as a service model together to make it simple and effective for people to use. And the consumer electronics are really enabling this fundamentally as time went by. The clinical experience was emerging up to COVID. As you'll see, much of the remote monitoring was focused on chronic diseases. There are folks like at the Ontario Telemedicine Network looking at congestive heart failure, in COPD, folks at Trinity Health at Home, looking at readmission, payers looking at unplanned care and disease management. A lot of this initial work focused on post-acute care and these very expensive chronic diseases, trying to control costs, engage members, and really help do long-term care management. But in the 2017, 18, 19, and certainly now in 2020, this emergence of bring your own device use your own cell phone, your own computer, your own tablet, has really come to be the norm. In our postpartum hypertension program, for example, the patients can use their own cell phones for four to six weeks to monitor their own blood pressures. A call center can look at alert. It coordinates care with the obstetricians. It's a very carefully scripted, pathway-driven approach with an algorithm to monitor out-of-bound results, to engage the patients, educate them. And it's a very sophisticated way to use this asynchronous form of remote monitoring. And the BYOD is an exciting new area that's rapidly emerging. Behind remote monitoring is the value, the financial model, which is really the heart of all of this. Prior to COVID, there was a lot that was happening in terms of the ability to derive direct revenue through E&M codes. There were RPM codes specifically using CCM codes and doing billing. The challenge here was not being able to bill for the call center and also the co-pays that the patient may have to incur and the frequency of collecting the co-pays. You could also sign contracts with hospitals or other entities to get direct revenue. Indirect revenue was elusive, but more is being learned about this. Cost avoidance, gain shares with payers, shared savings, risk models, the usual suspects. And that was still emerging, but there was definitely growing or increasing payer awareness. On the expense side, to control expense and really make these programs profitable, how you control the call center staffing costs, the ratios of the nurses, the types of alerts, and also looking at the integration costs of your vendor was very important. We also saw that the hardware costs could be high if they were lost, needed to be replaced at end of life. There were cellular charges, software as a service charges. Again, the hardware comes with many upsides, but also a potential financial downside as well. So when you get into expense control, which is always part of the financial model, how you use a BYOD capacity, bring your own device, use less kits, and try to avoid some of the direct shipping of kits is very important. But we did use direct shipping of kits to avoid having to hire drivers, which we had done in the past. But overall, this type of financial modeling was appearing and the vendor community was reacting to this and supporting this as well. But the payer landscape was really one of the most important parts that was evolving as CMS was offering more codes on top of that for e and billing. So the implications of this coming into COVID are very important. As of February, 2020, the implications of this were very important, especially with the financial model trending favorable with bring your own device. Also diversifying beyond traditional kits and chronic diseases and immediate post-acute using longitudinal care, behavioral care, care management, looking at specific diseases like diabetes or gestational diabetes, and bring your own device really gave us the ability to expand. And these platforms were emerging. 
the vendor landscape was consolidating, consumerization was happening through consumer electronics. So the stage was being set for remote monitoring to really move forward. And who would have thought it would have taken a pandemic to do it, but that's actually what happened. And so remote monitoring was ready and is fully prepared for this pandemic when it came. And just briefly, I want to call out the American Telemedicine Association. Joe, Christy, Christopher, we're all on the board. There's an article in the journal of Telemedicine and eHealth that really sets the stage for a lot of this in many articles on congestive heart failure, including those in health affairs up to this point. And there's a lot of work on social media. You can follow us as well. But that's really helps to tell the story about the evolution of remote monitoring up to COVID. And then COVID arrived and everything changed. It was the stage had been set, the foundation had been laid, so to speak, it was ready, and then now it was time to use it. Over to you, Christopher. Thank you, Dr. Watson. That was a great presentation. I want to remind everybody to please submit your questions for the Q&A session that we'll have at the end of today's webinar. I'm excited to announce our second speaker of the day, Christopher Northam, the Vice President of Telehealth at HCA Healthcare. Welcome, Christopher. Thank you, Christy. It's my pleasure to be with you here today. We were very fortunate that in our preparation for our COVID-19 response, HCA had worked with Vivify Health for a number of years on our remote patient monitoring full kitted platform. And this allowed us very effectively with tremendous results to support our bone marrow transplant and kidney transplant patients and with the home-based solutions. This provided us a really solid foundation and relationship in order to be able to very quickly determine what were the most effective ways that we could pivot and use the Vivify Go solution in order to support what we had identified was a key need for screening and monitoring on bring your own devices for our patients and employees in response to COVID-19. I know this is a really busy slide. However, there's a lot of information that we'd like to be able to provide. And in such a short period of time, I feel like this slide gets the point across. So we quickly moved from identifying the need to developing the solution and rapidly deploying that solution in a very short period of time. So from the middle of February, where we had initially identified that we would need to have a solution that could support our population of employees and patients outside of our hospitals and at their homes, we selected the Vivify Go solution and went to work on being able to put in place a combined cross-functional team from Vivify and HCA focused on clinical, technical, and operational needs to be able to support our patients and employees. As you can see in the metrics, we realized tremendous adoption and utilization. And one surprise that we had through this process was that it took hold so richly with our employees. Our employee health as an infection disease teams really were able to rapidly take this solution and internalize it in our hospitals so that we would be able to safeguard our employees and our patients. As you can see from our patient metrics, we realized a significantly lower level of adoption and utilization. Although the acceptance rate being 25%, we still found that to be very positive in the support of our patient population that was being discharged from our emergency rooms, either te having tested positive or presumptive. <laughs> Without going through all the other information on this slide, I think that I want to focus on the program differentiators, both from clinical protocols and the education, the way with that we were able to integrate into our electronic medical records very rapidly, and then be able to report on this information on a daily basis and provide that reporting across our facilities and across the enterprise. As you can see, this rapid timeline illustration shows us moving from phase one rapidly through phase two and getting to phase three during the latter part of March and being live on both employee and patient support by the end of 
March, beginning of April. As we continue to progress and evolve through phases four and five, I think it's important for me to note that the corporate internal audit team, at my request, conducted an agile internal audit of all processes and programs related to the Vivify Go solution. We were able to quickly be able to identify other areas that we could improve on and make it a more capable tool that supported our employees and patients, as well as the nurse navigators that were supporting all patients and employees that had been enrolled in the system. And in phase six and ongoing, we continue to refine and enhance these capabilities over the course of the coming months. We anticipate that we will continue to have this program in support of predominantly our employees and be ready to re-engage if the patient population surges occur again. Focusing on the monitoring section of this slide, some of the rich capabilities of the Vivify Go tool allowed us not only to exchange information multiple times a day with our patients in a bi-directional fashion, and also allowed our care teams to determine whether the patient who was being cared for in a routine screening and monitoring allowed our care team to monitor patients that were both routine and determine whether patients needed to be elevated to the enhanced monitoring, which would allow for care team members to reach out to the patient or, and be able to determine whether or not they should return to a higher level of care. A critical component of this being an effective solution is the care team. The ability for our care teams to monitor our patients and employees and to provide real-time guidance and support for our patients and employees has been a key differentiator of the solution. It allows for that 24-hour a day, seven-day-a-week coverage and gives the assurance to both our patients and employees that they have that lifeline from the care team that is able to help them should they have a change in condition, should they just want additional information on symptoms that they may be having. All in all, this has been a tremendous solution. We're very grateful to our Vivify partners and I'm grateful to the cross-functional teams that have worked together inside HCA and with the Vivify Health team to ensure that our patients and our employees had such a solution to really ensure both their care and to reassure them in a challenging time for all of us. In summary, I'm extraordinarily grateful to the Vivify Health team as well as my colleagues across HCA, both clinical, technical, and operational, which have allowed us to deploy and use the Vivify Go solution for our COVID-19 response to have it be such a rich and effective tool in ensuring that our patients' employees were able to have the assurance that they had a care team member a call away and that they had real-time information that they were being provided through our monitoring dashboard to ensure that if there was a change in status, if there was a need that our patient or employee had, that they were able to have that bi-directional communication at all times, 24 hours a day. And this has really afforded us a great opportunity to continue the capabilities that we've started here and continue to develop on those capabilities and enhance them to better support our patients and employees as we go forward. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you, Christopher. Again, everybody, please remember to submit your questions for the Q&A session at the end of today's webinar. Last but not least is our third speaker, Dr. Joe Kavidar, who's a professor of dermatology at Harvard Medical School, a leader in telehealth, and the current president of the American Telemedicine Association. Welcome, Dr. Kavidar. Well, thanks so much for inviting me to be part of this uh, webinar, and I'm delighted to share with you thoughts on the future of remote patient monitoring. So I'm here representing the American Telemedicine Association. There's no better organization to serve you at this time. We really represent all of the facets of the telehealth industry. We find those rising tides, floats all boats, initiatives that we can all get behind and try to move 
adoption of this very important care delivery model forward. But what really is important for us to focus on, and everyone is very focused on the pandemic and how that's changed telehealth, but this particular slide illustrates an issue that was there before the pandemic and won't go away. And that is that if we only do things face-to-face -face with our patients, whether it be video or in the office, we are running out of clinicians to meet the demand for services. And as you can see, this started happening around 2010. It's become more magnified over the last decade. The only solution to this particular challenge is to do what I call one-to-many care. And the idea behind one-to-many care is that you can have a clinician spread across populations of patients. There are many ways to do that, chatbots, artificial intelligence, digital front door, but remote patient monitoring is one of the most effective. And the idea that you can have a clinician or a series of clinicians in a call center environment caring for hundreds of patients by management by exception is really the topic that makes it so imperative that we adopt this for part of our healthcare landscape going forward. Now we have an opportunity. Telehealth is a household word. It wasn't that way six months ago. And now that we have that traction with our patients and providers, it's time for us to rethink how we use this tool set and move beyond simple video visits and audio only visits, which are, of course, all the rage now. We've brought the doctor's office into your home. And again, we need to revel in that success, but we need to think differently about how we use this technology in the next phase of this exciting development. The next frontier on the list of adoption after video visits has to be remote patient monitoring. I'm gonna share a couple of examples of why it's such a powerful technology. This is connected cardiac care or heart failure telemonitoring. You can see the devices on the slide that are given to patients, typically on discharge, but it could be because they are selected for being at high risk for readmission to the hospital. And every day they upload vital signs. And again, a nurse call center monitors those by exception so that only the patients that need attention get attention. And on the left-hand side of the slide, you can see the results from a year-long study we did, the top line being all-cause readmissions to the hospital and the bottom line being heart failure-related readmissions to the hospital. And both went down by about 50% using this very, very powerful tool. This one is slightly different. This is high blood pressure or diabetic monitoring. The diabetic monitoring would be using a connected glucometer, the high blood pressure using a connected blood pressure cuff. But the concepts are similar in that patients uh, connect, upload information, and a clinician can view that information in a dashboard. And importantly, again, connect with those patients who need care, whereas Patients who don't need care can get either automated messages or other ways of engaging them through software, thus creating this concept of one to many. So really it's our opportunity now to reimagine healthcare. And there are several ideas around how we might do that that are related to remote patient monitoring. One of them is digital therapeutics, which is a slightly different but very much up and coming. And you can see examples of companies in the space and market uh, size on this slide. I'll, I'll just point out Achille Interactive as one. I have no relationship to any of these companies, but Achille Interactive uses a gaming environment to treat children with ADHD. And it's been incredibly successful. Anybody who in the audience who knows about ADHD knows how really terrible, I would say, the medical treatments are for that condition. So you have now a software game being as effective or more effective than standard medical therapy. That's what digital therapeutics is about. And it's really an offshoot of remote patient monitoring. And you're gonna see more and more of that in the future. This one is United Healthcare. This is the use of a standard fitness tracker, Fitbit or other type of device to motivate employees to do these three things, and you can see them here quickly. Frequency is that you get up about every half hour and move around for five minutes. Intensity is you have to take your 30-minute walk, and tenacity is to get your 10,000 steps. 
for each one of these that you do, you get a dollar in your health savings account. If you do all three, you get an extra dollar. This is again in, in uh, United Health Group's portfolio of things they offer their employer benefits groups to offer their employees. There are other examples of this in the marketplace. You'll see more and more of this in the future where you're really getting into this very sort of different zone, which is employee wellness using remote patient monitoring as a substrate for feedback loops and motivation. There's plenty of innovating left to do. This slide just illustrates how we have all of these solutions in the marketplace to work with patients, usually to motivate them to care better for themselves. As I said earlier, do one-to-many care management, and they all look very different, and they don't tie together, which is why I think it's very important for us to realize that this puzzle analogy that I've used on this slide is that the puzzle pieces are starting to come together, but they don't fit at all yet, and that's going to be, I think, another next phase of this very exciting space is to see people that to start to put these different things together, joining, say, especially a telehealth company with a chat bot and maybe a remote monitoring device or a software device in the home. So you look to see more and more of that, maybe add a digital therapeutic in as well. Very, very exciting. And what we really want to get to is this fully integrated digital and in-person experience. We have this in other arenas that we consume services, whether it be for, say, flagging a ride or having groceries delivered to our doorstep. But in healthcare, everything is still call, wait for a voicemail, get a response. It's very analog. And we need to start creating these scenarios so that when patients want to interact with us, they instinctively go to their mobile device or their digital device first. And that's their opening into a healthcare delivery system, which as I said earlier, is one to many and involves all of those touch points that remote patient monitoring has proven can be so effective. Thank you. And these are my contact information and I'm delighted to be with you today and participate in the question and answer. Thank you, Dr. Kavidar. Everyone, please remember to submit your questions for the Q&A session at the end of today's webinar. We will start that in just about a minute so you don't wanna leave. I want to thank all of our speakers today, Dr. Watson, Christopher Northam, and Dr. Kavidar. Thank you for your presentation today. We appreciate you being here today. We're about to start the best part of the entire session, so stay tuned. We'll start up our Q&A session in just about a minute. Thank you.